again on Sunday evenings. We are preaching through a series called Our Future Foretold. We're going to go through prophetic texts beginning with the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. And as we uh, read the text tonight, I, I um, hope this is you're beginning to put these things together, especially through this text. Uh, but I know there are some difficulties when we consider these things. And so what I hope to do, again, as we work through the text is um, to walk through the text by way of reminder or give you some historical setting, maybe give you an opportunity to pick up some extra tidbits or extra nuggets here and there that might help you by way of reminder to put some things together. So we'll do that again. Uh, if you are um, get tired easily with repetition, please forgive me. If otherwise <laughs> this repetition is helpful to you, that's the point. I hope that it is. And then um, we will work through, again this evening, verses 15 through 28 and finish that section tonight and move on with the rest of the Olivet Discourse beginning next Sunday evening. So Matthew chapter 24, and I want to read the text for us beginning in verse 15, and then we will uh, get into our sermon this evening. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, thank you for this time to study your word tonight. Lord, please, uh, again, we uh, pray, uh, help us with an understanding of this text, Lord. Help us to uh, consider what you've revealed to us here, uh, to think through uh, how these various moving parts seem to fit together, Lord, uh, to give us a picture of what you've revealed. Uh, Help us to um, think Uh, about these things deeply. Uh, Lord, help us to meditate on these things and to consider them. And we know that just meditating on the Scriptures, Lord, with the help of your Spirit is um, just such a fruitful thing, uh, Lord, and that you, by your Spirit, guide us into truth. And so help us with these things. We admit and acknowledge that we, apart from you, cannot understand them. Uh, So we need your help in this. And just guide us as we walk through the text. I pray that you'll give my brothers and sisters uh, understanding, help me to be clear, and may Christ be exalted as always, Lord. We love you and pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 to 31. So again, as we get into the text, on Palm Sunday, the week of his passion, the Lord Jesus Christ enters the city of Jerusalem amid shouts of praise and the singing of hallelujahs. It's his triumphal entry. Uh, Coming face to face then with the hostility and the hatred of the Pharisees and of the religious elite. Uh, And later that same day, Uh, Having faced that hostility, he would cleanse the temple, driving out those who bought and sold there. The next day, after the disciples witnessed the withering of the fruitless fig tree, all of these things symbolic, right? He teaches the parable of the wicked vine dressers and pronounces judgment against them. He would teach three parables of judgment on that day, each making clear that because the Jews had rejected him... God's Messiah, God had rejected them from being a nation before him. Matthew chapter 21, verse 42, makes this clear. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the Lord says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. Whoever falls on this stone will be broken But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. With that text, we're reminded of Daniel, right, chapter 2, where the small stone crushes the statue, right, and then grows into a great mountain that fills the the entire earth. 
This small stone, Matthew 21, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So as the Pharisees and as the scribes become increasingly angry, plotting how they might kill him, he pronounces further judgment upon them in the woes of Matthew chapter 23. This is followed by his tearful farewell in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, where he says there, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See then, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus Christ then withdraws from the temple. He withdraws from Jerusalem. He exits the eastern gate. He crosses the Kidron Valley, and he now sits atop the Mount of Olives and delivers this discourse in Matthew chapter 24 to his disciples. The Jews have rejected their Messiah. God has rejected the Jews. And what follows is a chronology now of what happens next. You understand that, right? What follows is a chronology of what happens next. After his disciples remarked in awed wonder at the buildings making up the temple complex, Jesus says in verse 2, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, struck with that pronouncement of judgment, the disciples follow with two questions then in verse 3. When will these things be, they ask. And then, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Now, in verses 4 through 14, the Lord explains characteristic or representative events that will mark those days leading up to the temple, the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And he describes them as only the beginning of sorrows. These are characteristic or representative marks leading up to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. And he describes them as the beginning of sorrows or the beginning of birth pains, the beginning of contraction, so to speak, in verse 8. These signs, these representative events are like contractions in pregnancy. They increase in frequency and they increase in severity. And he is describing here an age of tribulation that continues from that time until now and will continue, right? This is representative of the church age. In verse 14, he is describing the age in which the gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This section of text from verses 4 to 14 then really is describing the church age. Our age is this time of increasing tribulation in which it is our responsibility to preach the gospel. Okay, now distinguished from divine wrath or the Greek word orge, which falls upon the wicked, divine wrath that is reserved for the wicked, the word tribulation, sleepsis in the Greek, or its verbal cognate, phlebo, tribulation is described as that which is endured by the saints. There are those in dispensational circles who believe that this is entirely future, that the tribulation happens seven years before the end, and the church will be raptured before that tribulation begins because they've not been reserved for wrath. Well, they've not been. The church has not been reserved for wrath. Wrath is reserved for the wicked. But we know from biblical history, from the Bible itself, that the saints do endure tribulation. So this period of tribulation is describing the church age. Of the roughly 55 occurrences of those words for tribulation, either flipsis or its verbal cognate, phlebo, 47 of them refer to tribulation that is endured by the saints. So it's a pretty overwhelming uh, number, okay? So this tribulation is speaking of that which the saints endure. Jesus said to his disciples, in the world you will have tribulation. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 9, John describes himself as our brother and companion in the tribulation. Okay? So we, we face this time of tribulation. This time of tribulation, verses 4 to 14, describes the age in which we're currently in. It is a time under which we preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, and then 
and then the end will come. However, there will in the future be a time of unprecedented tribulation. Great tribulation is described in verse 21 as that which has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now that time of tribulation, although certainly foreshadowed by the events of 70 AD and the destruction of the temple, is marked off by the sign described by the Lord in verse 15. Look at verse 15 with me. In verse 15, the Lord responds to the disciples' question regarding the sign of his coming and of the end of the age. That sign is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Verse 15 says this, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. This then, if you think about this text, this then is a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 27. We'll study in small groups, Daniel chapter 9, when we get there soon. And that abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel 9, now referenced by the Lord in chapter 24, verse 15 of Matthew, reflects an ongoing pattern of near fulfillments, if you will, pointing ultimately to a future far fulfillment, an ultimate abomination of desolation, if you will, that will usher in the end. The Lord points us back to Daniel, where we see an abomination of desolation spoken of in several chapters, and again, establishing there for us a repetitive pattern of what that abomination of desolation looks like, what it is, and that pattern, that repetitive pattern, points us forward into the future. Now, we looked at those characteristics of this abomination in Daniel, and through those characteristics, we're to understand what to look for in the future when the ultimate abomination of desolation comes. That's what he means when the Lord says, let the reader understand, right? Let the reader understand. Now, the Lord mentions the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. If you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, of the roughly five times that this phrase is used, the holy place, it's being used of the temple. And that's the way from the New Testament that we understand that statement, the holy place. If we view these events in verses 15 to 28 as future for reasons, many reasons previously explained, and we know that the temple is going to be destroyed in AD 70, then how are we to understand this reference to the holy place in verse 15? And how are we to understand the specific Jewish or Judean references that immediately follow? Look at verse 16. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now prior to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the Jews did flee, but they didn't flee to the mountains. They fled to a city east of the Jordan called Pella. They didn't flee to the mountains. Look at verse 17. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. That was a very typically uh, Jewish thing to communicate, right? They, they spent time on their rooftops. And when the city was going to be under siege, there would be no time for them to flee. Uh, they would not go down into their house to get anything. The assumption would be they would just sort of run roof to roof to get out of there before the attack came. Then it says in verse 18, let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. There wouldn't be time. Pretty self-explanatory, right? The horrors of that time would be significant, right? Would be significant. The horrors of that future time will be tremendous, will be very significant. Look at verse 19. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath when stores would be closed, when various services would be unavailable, when transportation would be difficult, right? Christians don't keep those rabbinic Sabbath regulations but they would be subject to others who do. And so you pray, verse 20, that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. 
the destruction of the temple, that siege took place in the summer. Here, the Lord is referencing the winter, okay? Several things that would obviously lead us to think of these events as being past in AD 70 or around that time, but then there are certain difficulties with the text related to that. So let me explain. Although in verses 15 through 28, we see language that certainly seems to be eschatological or future, we also see language that appears to be historical or related to events, still future to the Lord Jesus Christ as he's given this discourse, but to us in the past and related to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Now this adds to the difficulty associated with understanding some of the Lord's references here. It's not easy, including Luke's account of this text where he mentions here Jerusalem itself surrounded by armies and instantaneously interpreters of that passage in Luke want to put that event then in AD 70 and the sack of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple. So do you see the difficulty, right? Do you see the difficulty? There are what seem to be historical references that make us want to take this text and push it back into the past, make it historical around the events of AD 70. And yet there are other statements that are only understandable if they're pushed forward into the far future when these events will be fulfilled ultimately. George Eldon Ladd is extremely helpful here. And I think that this is the best way to think about this. George Eldon Ladd says this, neither an exclusively historical nor an exclusively eschatological interpretation is satisfactory. We must allow for a double reference. We must allow for a mingling of historical and eschatological. You understand what George Eldon Ladd is saying there, right? Because of the way the text is arranged, because of the wording, the language of the text, we can't merely do one or the other. We can't push it all into the past, um, putting that all in the events surrounding AD 70 and the destruction of the temple, and we can't take the words that are being used and push them all into the future, right? There are some time-bound statements being made here. What is obvious in the text is an ongoing or a sustained tension between language that anticipates historical events like AD 70 and language that anticipates the consummation at the end of the age and the coming of the Son of Man. A tension between those two things. And Ladd is saying, we can't have either or, that it really is a both and. We must allow for double reference for a mingling of historical and eschatological. All right, so think about that then when we get to verse 21. Look at verse 21. And let's look at verse 21 in consideration of what George Eldon Ladd just said. For then, at that time, at that time, right, there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, not literal Israel, but genuine Christians, for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Right? So now, if you apply verses 21 and 22 to the events surrounding the destruction of the temple in AD 70, it's really difficult to believe how verse 21 is true. You see that? If you apply verses 21 and 22 to the events Proceeding leading up to and surrounding the destruction of the temple in AD 70, it's difficult to believe how that is true when we consider texts like Revelation chapter 7 through Revelation chapter 19. Okay? So, commentators then who want to keep verses 15 to 21 in the past prior to AD 70 have difficulty though moving verse 21 into the future, because as of this point, that creates a 2,000 year gap, essentially, between these events. And that gap makes people uncomfortable, makes me uncomfortable in trying to interpret the text. So then, if we consider that gap, again, the most plausible explanation then is to define the Great Tribulation to them as covering the entire period from AD 70 into the future, 
making it a further explanation of the church age that we already covered in verses 4 through 14. That's the way that many commentators solve that gap problem or solve the language problem. They define the great tribulation, 15 to 28, as being this entire age, right? Not just verses 4 through 14. And again, I would say that that is not necessary. Again, I believe the best explanation is the one that George Eldon Ladd has given us above. Neither an exclusively historical nor an exclusively eschatological interpretation is satisfactory. We must allow for a double reference for a mingling of historical and eschatological. This period, verse 21, and when we consider the entire section, verses 15 to 28, this period of great tribulation is speaking of or foreshadowing events that are still future. Again, we see those events associated with Revelation chapter 7 through 19. We see those events associated with the, with the last half of Daniel's 70th week that we'll cover soon in small group. And this is further supported by verse 29. Look at verse 29. Immediately, beginning at that time, beginning immediately after the tribulation of those days, then the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, immediately after the tribulation of those days, right? So again... What it looks like then is verses 15 to 28, speaking of an eschatological period of time at the end, immediately after which the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. We summarize that then. Verses 4 through 14, the age in which we're currently in, it's the church age, an age of tribulation in which this gospel of the kingdom will be preached. Then the end will come. The Lord Jesus Christ then points the disciples to his sign in Daniel, um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, the abomination of desolation. That characteristic pattern is again called to their attention of the abomination of desolation. And verses 15 to 28 point to a time in the future, an eschatological fulfillment at the end of the age prior to the coming return of Jesus Christ. But again, with that historical and eschatological language mingled there, double reference included in that text. All right, so then, look at verse 23. Then, or better translated, therefore, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs, false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, the Lord says, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. We've seen this before, right? You look at verse chapter 24, verse 5. He makes reference to this there. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, will deceive many. We also saw it in verse 11. You drop down there. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. The Lord is saying here, listen, don't believe them. His return at the end of the age will be unmistakable. It will be overtly obvious, easy to see. And what follows then is certainly future. Look at verse 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And again, it's within this section running from verses 15 to 28. He's referencing in verse 27 the coming of the Son of Man. In that day, there will be those who say, look, here's the Christ, or there. We're not to believe them. False Christs, false prophets will rise, show great signs and wonders. We've not seen that yet, right? Still future. Those great signs and wonders will be so great that they might, if possible, even deceive the elect. But that's not possible. (laughs) See, the Lord says in verse 25, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's out there in the desert. Where no one else will see him. Prophets often came into the desert, right? He's not going to be away somewhere where you have to go and find him. Look, he's in the inner rooms. He's not going to be in some secret room where you're not going to be able to see him. It's going to be evident, going to be obvious. As the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It will be overtly obvious to God's people. Verse 28. And again, this pictures Revelation 19, wherever the carcass is. There the eagles will be gathered together. Again, this is all future. Look at verse 29 then. Immediately, immediately, beginning at that time, 
beginning immediately after the tribulation of those days, then the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. That brings to mind Acts chapter 2, verse 19. Turn there with me quickly. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. And the Lord referencing this with respect to his return in Acts chapter 2. And again, referencing these same wonders in the heavens. Acts chapter 2, verse 19. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when we see this in verse 29, again, we're thrust forward in verse 29 to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Immediately after that tribulation described in verses 15 to 28, Immediately after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then the Son of Man, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, Lord, thank you again for the blessed opportunity of studying this text. Uh, again, help us, Lord, to understand these things. Uh, help us to think about them clearly. And Lord, help us to consider uh, what you have told us here. We're grateful, Lord, as I'm sure even your disciples were in the upper room as you explained what was awaiting them. We thank you, Lord, that you've explained these things to us beforehand. It causes us, Lord, to look to you in faith, causes us, Lord, to look to you in trust and to um, consider you and your return as we live our daily lives, uh, watchful in these things, looking forward to your return, uh, the imminency of your return, Lord. And um, I pray that we would conduct ourselves through our, our time here in fear uh, considering you, obeying you, living for you, and waiting for your uh, glorious appearing. So we thank you, Lord, for your revelation of these things to us. And thank you, Lord, for the joy of considering them in this text. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.